Hello, I'm Jeffrey DeSmit. I'm going to show you how to use artificial intelligence in Java. More specifically, I'm going to show you how to do planning optimization, which saves one of, some of our users up to hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Today, I'll show you how to code this school time tabling application from scratch using Quarkus and OptaPanner. This application, uh, when we click the solve button, will generate a timetable for us. And these timetables will improve the life for teachers and students. Because it'll, it will take into account the number of constraints that we add to it. With that experience, you can then tackle other use cases, such as equipment scheduling, where we need to assign things such as beds in hospitals to patients. Um, and we want to improve the utilization of those things, which could also be things like CAT scanners um, or other uh, equipment. Um, we'll also, you'll also be able to tackle job shop scheduling, where we want to make uh, items, uh, for example, books or furniture or things like that, or cars. And we want to reduce the make span, which is the time to create those items. Again, increasing efficiency of our factories in this particular case. You'll learn about another case you can tackle is vehicle routing. Um, this is probably the most interesting or at least the most profitable case. This is the case where we have users saving uh, a ton of money and a ton of uh, CO2 emissions. And that's simply by reducing the driving time. So we've seen uh, driving time reductions of 20, 25 percent, um, which as you can imagine on a fleet of tens of thousands of vehicles uh, makes a huge difference in um, productivity uh, and fuel in, uh, fuel and carbon emissions and things like that. Also bin packing is a typical use case, for example, on optimizing cloud resources um, and so forth. And a very favored one, of course, of course, employee rostering, uh, where we're assigning shifts to uh, employees and to take into account their wishes and their desires uh, as, as a, um, about their free time and their desired and undesired time off. Um, but today we'll, we're going to focus specifically on school time tabling. So school time tabling, in this problem, we need to assign these le lessons to um, rooms and to uh, time slots, right? So for example, we have room A and B here, and we have a, a two time slots here, A30 till 9.30 and 9.30 until 10.30. Now there's a number of constraints we need to take into account. Uh, in this particular case, I'm only showing some of the hard constraints, which is that uh, these two um, lessons have the same students group. They're both going towards the ninth grade. In this case, there's only one group of students, one class of students in the ninth grade. It's a very simple school. And we need to make sure that these two lessons don't happen at the same time. The same thing here with chemistry and French. They cannot happen at the same time, not because they're the, they're the same grade, they're a different one as you can see, but because they're the same teacher, both uh, being given by Marie Curie. So of course, uh, that teacher cannot be at two places at the same time. And of course, and the last two here, as you can see, have again the same students group. Right. So these are a number of constraints. Now what we're going to do is we're going to create those lessons and those rooms. We're going to give those to OptoPlanner. That's our problem. And OptoPlanner will then save, will actually give us a solution which uh, adheres to all of these constraints, right? Um, especially adheres to all of the hard constraints and does its utmost best to adhere to as many soft constraints as possible. Um, so how are we going to build this application? Well, we're going to use, uh, as I said earlier, Quarkus for that and the Quarkus platform. And we're going to expose a REST service. And using Quarkus, we're going to use the, the extensions REST easy to expose that REST service. We're going to, of course, use OptoPlanner to optimize that, uh, to find that optimal or near optimal timetable. And we're going to use Hibernate, uh, the, the Hibernate extension to store uh, all that data into a normal relational database. Of course, if you build this yourself, you might want to replace certain aspects of this. Instead of a REST service, you might want to look at a GM, uh, at pulling from a GMS queue. Uh, instead of a relational database, you might want to sw swap that out to Hibernate OMG to connect to no, uh, no SQL databases and so forth, uh, or any other extension um, to connect to any 
other types of databases or data stores. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. So I think that's enough talk. Let's get started. The first thing we need to do is we need to set up our project uh, with a build file. So I'm going to take the easy route here and I'm just going to go to code.quarkus.io and I'm going to use that website to generate me a project uh, and the build file. So let's take a look how that works. So this is code.quarkus.io. As you can see here at the top, I can, I'm going to generate a Maven file and um, I can of course also cho choose Gradle, uh, but I'll go with Maven today. Um, I'm going to call this, um, yeah, the Acme, good, uh, the Acme group is good. I'm going to create a timetabling uh, subgroup there and my project will be called school time tabling. Here we go. Now, of course, we need a number of extensions, right? If you remember from the platform uh, diagram I showed earlier, we will need to, we want to expose this with REST, um, with REST Easy specifically, and we want to, we'll use Jackson for the JSON um, serialization, right? As we're sending a JSON file to our UI. Um, the next thing we need is, of course, Hibernate. I'm going to use Hibernate with Panache. Uh, so Hibernate ORM with Panache to go to the database, which makes it a little, a little bit faster to implement all of this stuff. And the last thing we need, of course, is OptoPlanner. Um, that's the AI part. So let's go down here and that's over here. We're going to use OptoPlanner, the constraint solver AI to, um, uh, as we shown earlier, to optimize the timetable. And um, later at the end of this video, I'll also actually send the score uh, back to the UI to show it there. And the score is something that comes out of OptoPlanner. And of course, we want that to be in pretty JSON too. So we're going to use that uh, JSON binding for the OptoPlanner score classes too. Okay, that's it. These four, these four extensions, that should, that's enough. Um, let's generate our application, All right? So we download a zip. Uh, let's open that zip file. As you can see, I have, a, I have it over here and I can now extract it. So I'm going to extract it to this demo folder over here. And there we go. We can show the files and close this. So what you can see here is we now have uh, a nice POM file and uh, we have some, we have a readme file and some Docker and some git ignores already there. We can remove those if we don't like those. Um, and we even can just run it with Maven, uh, the Maven wrapper is even included. So let's open this thing up in our ID. I'm going to use IntelliJ today. So let me do that. So um, I'm going to, open in id over here i'm going to you i'm going to go to that directory um, which is in temp demo here school time tabling i'm opening that okay it's opening over here so here we go um and it's loading you can see it's loading here at the bottom um, there we go and we have our first application here. So let's tr try to build that. But before we do that, let's jump into the POM file. So by default, this uses Java 11. Um, I still build with Java 8. Um, I'm kind of old apparently. So, but I'll just switch to 8 here for me. And then the next thing, of course, is I'm going to, for now, uh, I actually comment out the OptoPlanner part for a minute as we'll just focus on the domain and the rest and the, the database first before we jump into the other parts. Uh, let's import these changes and let's open the terminal and let's build this. So we can now do Maven clean install, of course. And as you can see, that works. Well, it's building. Let's see if it works. There's actually test included in there if you want to take a look at that. There's an example REST file in there also, right? Um, and of course, you can build this natively too um, for people who are interested in that part, which I will show at the end of this, this presentation. Okay, um, now let's see what's in here. So uh, like I said, there's an example resource in here already, um, which if you go to localhost 8080 hello, we will get a return back of hello. So let's try that out. Let's do maven compile quark as a dev. All right, here we go. That's uh, booting up. Let's go to the over here. Let me just go to localhost 
Um, if you go to localhost, we can see the static website here, uh, which is included there. Um, by the way, if you're wondering where that is, that's over here in the resources, that this, that's this index file. Um, and of course, we can now do hello, and we get back hello. And just to show you that this is Quarkus, we can say hello world, and we just go to the over here, and we just refresh, and we see hello world, right? This is the, the speed at which you develop in Quarkus. Okay, so... Time to make some changes. We leave the dev mode on, of course. Um, so the first things first, um, we are going to uh, have to, we're going to need a domain model. So I'm going to add here a new package called domain, right? And remember, we're scheduling uh, lessons into time slots and into rooms. So uh, let's maybe start with a time slot. Okay, time slot class. Here we go. Oh. Uh, let me delete that. I need to ask for a new Java class, not a file. Um, so a time slot class, here we go. Now what I'm going to put in here is I'm going to give this an ID. Now um, I'm going to choose to give all of my objects here just a plain old long ID. Of course you can use a UUID, you can use a string, or you can probably not use a new ID at all if you're not going to a relational database, right? But I want to actually put this all into a relational database, so I'll just use, I'll need an ID, okay? Um, I'm going to, every time slot, that's basically a time when a lesson can happen, um, it happens on a specific day of the week, Right. I cannot put a date here. Why can I not put a date? Because the schedule repeats every week. So I can just say this is a time slot that happens on Monday and it will happen this week on Monday, but it will also happen next week on Monday. We're just we're just creating a, a timetable for one week. Um, of course, it needs to have uh, a starting time. So I'm going to use local time here, start time. And there we go. And I'm going to use, and of course it needs an end time. Um, so let's add an end time too. Sounds great. Uh, for simplicity reasons, all the time slots here will have the same duration. All of the lessons will take the same amount of time. Um, now uh, I'll need a dummy constructor, an empty constructor, uh, well, not a dummy constructor, no arc constructor because of this being JSON nified through Jackson, right? Um, and later when I want to create some test data, I will also want this extra constructor here so I can just create them easily. Um, let's add some getters. This is Java, of course. So let's just do that. And I also later will I'll show you how to how this shows up in the log if 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 you want to look at what opt.planner is actually doing. So I'm going to add it to string here so that log is really readable. And the key there is um, if you want to really easily read those logs, that's a personal hint of mine, is to keep this short. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to take the day of week and I'm going to add the start time and that's it. Right? Uh, clean and simple. Okay, uh, that's our time slot class. So the important thing is about these is, besides the ID, of course, is that it starts, it's a certain day of week, start time and an end time. So for example, Monday from nine to, to 10 and or from 10 to 11, right? Okay, next class, next domain object. The next one is the room. Uh, the room is much simpler. So a room will give that an ID, of course, and will give that a, a name. And of course, it needs again an empty constructor because of the uh, the Jackson thing, and it also needs uh, we'll want a constructor for a test data which just takes the name, and of course we want some getters because this is Java, and then for the logging I would like to overwrite it to string again and just return the name, All right? And here we go, that's the room. Next, the next one is the lesson. So let's create a file for the class for the lesson. So we'll be assigning multiple lessons, right? And here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, so first things first, of course, uh, let's give it an ID. Um, and let's, 
a lesson has a subject, right? Like this is a lesson for math, this is a lesson for French, this is a lesson for Spanish, right? Lesson for English, of course. Um, each lesson also has a teacher. Um, to make things, to keep things simple, I'm going to use uh, the string uh, for a teacher, which is just the teacher's name. Of course, in a more elaborate example, you would actually create a teacher of domain class, and you would actually just reference it to teacher called domain class here. And that's of course all possible. I'm just going to keep it simple here. Um, and of course, we need a student group. That's the, 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 the class of students that are attending this lesson. Um, and you'll see in the example, I'll really simplify that to simply the grade, the 9th grade or the 10th grade. It's a very small school that I'll show here. Uh, but you could just have one 9th grade, um, the math class or the STEM class, and 9th grade, the art class or something like that. So you can actually split those up. And of course, these classes could actually share teachers who, uh, uh, who do lessons across multiple students groups right now on top of this each lesson needs to occur in a specific time slot and in a specific room and those are a little bit special so let's first add those right so in a specific time slot this is when the when the lesson happens and this is the room where it happens right now the interesting thing about these is that these are not known in advance the time slot in the room that's actually optoplanner's job that's the ai the artificial intelligence job right so Changes this changes during planning, right? This is actually initialized during planning, initialized and even changes, uh, initialized and even changes during planning. Okay, good. Um, again, we want an empty constructor. This time it's not just for Jackson, actually, OptoPlanner will need an empty constructor here too. Um, and of course, we still want the uh, the subject, the teacher, and the student group to be easily uh, set for our test data later. So I'm going to create a constructor like this here. Um, now let's create a bunch of getters for all of this stuff. Here we go. Oh, here we go. And um, again, I like to have a, a good uh, two string so I can watch out in the logs what's going on, on. So what I'll do is I'm just going to return the subject here. Um, now the problem is that some that the subject itself is not unique. So for example, um, the math the math teacher can actually do multiple uh, can do. Um, will actually for the same teacher might actually teach multiple lessons to the same student group so just adding teacher or student group won't make it unique either so if all else fails let's just add the id right um, so i'm just going to add the id just to so so we can distinguish between different lesson instances that have the same lesson the same subject of the same a teacher for the same student group and in that case we can differentiate them in the log at least by the id and if you actually look into the application you'll see that the id is slightly grayed out there on the bottom left right of each lesson for this uh, debugging purposes right this is purely for debugging purposes uh, in a real ui you would hide that okay um looks good now we have a bunch, we'll have a bunch of lessons, we'll have a bunch of rooms, a bunch of time slots. Um, we'd like to wrap this in a data set which we can just send to the UI in, in one go, right? So, and also in give it to OptoPlanner in one go and so forth. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a timetable object, right? And so, a timetable object is has a list, has basically all of the information for one particular school, for one particular uh, tenant, right? So I'm going to use, I'm going to give it a list of time slot list, lists, right? A list of time slots. I'm going to give, give it a list of uh, first rooms, right? A room list. I'm going to give it a list of lesson, a lesson list. Um, and uh, that's uh, enough for now. I'm going to give it an empty constructor again, both for Jason as well, Jackson as well as um, OptoPlanner in this particular case. And I'm going to give it a constructor where I just for when I create a test data later on. Okay. And uh, let's add some getters. Here we go. Yep. And um, uh, on this, I really don't care about the two string because uh, this is not showing up in the logs. So I'm going to leave it out. Um, we had an example resource here that came with the example. I'm going to throw that out. It also means that, of course, I'd better throw out these tests. So let's do that. 
Um, and let's add an extra uh, package here for the rest stuff. Here we go for the rest stuff. So now we have our domain objects. And now we want to expose this through REST methods so we can actually see those uh, happening in our browser. So let's create um, a timetable resource. Here we go, a Java class, a Java class, timetable resource. What do we want to do in this timetable resource? Um, basically, we want to add a method here, public timetable get timetable right and, and we'll implement that in a minute um, and we want to make sure that's exposed through rest so we're going to add a path here um, for um, let's say let's use uh, dash timetable we're going to add some producers producers here this is purely going to be um, media type uh, application is first injected. Uh, first, take that. All right. Okay. We want to have a time, uh, a media type of application JSON, and we want to make sure that anything we 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 can we get from the service also is JSON, right? So it looks like a good start. Uh, one thing's missing, of course. We need a method with a getter. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a get method here. Okay, so now we ex exposed um, uh, this timetable thing through REST. It accepts JSON, it consumes JSON, and it's a simple getter, uh, and you get this information back. Now, what do we want to get back here? We want to create, a, we're going to get back a new timetable. Um, in the end, of course, this will need to come for the database, but for now, just to see if we get this rolling so far, I'm going to create a dummy one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a dummy time slot over here, new time slot for um, the day of week Monday for local time of, um, here we go, of 8.30, seems like a good start for the first lesson and local time of uh, up to 9.30. So this is the start time and the end time of this particular lesson, right? Okay, we're going to create a room also. Here we go, no room. Uh, let's just call it room A, okay? And we're going to create a lesson, lesson, no lesson. And um, this lesson, uh, so as you can see, we need a subject teacher and a student group. So I'm going to give this lesson, it's called the math lesson. The best person to give this, I guess, is probably, not, there's others, of course, in history, but let's, do, let's go with Alan Turing. And uh, the student group, let's do, just call this the ninth grade, right? Um, there's just one class in the ninth grade. Uh, it's a simple, small school. So now we get, need to put this into this uh, timetable. So I'm just going to use collections singleton list of the time slot, the collections singleton list of the room, and of course, collections singleton list of the lesson. Here we go. And let's see, We this is Quarkus, right? So what we just simply do is we jump here, we refresh, the hello resource is of course now gone. We now here add, uh, we look for the timetable. When we ask for the timetable, we get our pretty JSON thing back, right? And you can see this is all gone through Jackson and this is all looking pretty okay, right? Time slot, the ID of course was null because we didn't fill that in, um, the day of week, Monday and so forth and so forth. Okay. This is pretty ugly to look at, right? Well, it's not ugly, it's just, it's it's not really visual to look at, right? And um, so the next step is, of course, we want to have a pretty uh, UI interface, right? Um, and we're going to put that here, we're going to uh, we're going to put that in this file here. Let's get rid of the default index HTML. Now, I could write you the, in, the HTML in the JavaScript here. Unfortunately, when I 
when I write JavaScript, I'm, I don't really like JavaScript. It's not really my language. And um, it would actually turn this video into an R-rated video, which I don't want. So I'm just going to copy the uh, UI in this particular case, as it's uh, potentially less interesting. So I'm just going to copy in here three files. These three files are the HTML file, which uh, shows uh, the pretty UI, the JS file, which um, handles the buttons and so forth. This is using Twitter Bootstrap and things like that. And um, a logo because I like showing a logo of Optic Planner because uh, that's my project, right? So let's see what happens now. I, uh, so the REST servers, of course, hasn't changed, but if I now go to 8080, you can see I have a pretty UI. Um, now, what do I have in this UI? As you can see, we have our room here, we have our time slot over here, um, and it looks pretty okay. We have our first lesson here, Matt by Alan Turing, ninth grade. You can see the ID, there is no ID here because the ID was null still. This hasn't been in a database or anything like that yet. And when we click the solve button, we get a bit, big pretty error message, of course, because all of that stuff hasn't been implemented yet. Um, we cannot also not just add, a, a, let's say, add a room, uh, let's say add a room D here, submit the room, that all that stuff doesn't work, of course. So it's time to actually implement that stuff. So let's go back. Um, the next thing we need is um, we need to make these things JPA friendly. So let's start with the time slot, that's last time. So if we go to the time slot, what we're going to do is we're going to first make sure, so this is making them hibernate friendly, we're going to put them into the database. Is This is an entity, something we want to put into the uh, database. Of course, anything that goes into a relational database needs an ID, and specifically, we're going to use uh, the DISDs will be generated on the database. So I'm going to just put that to strategy generated auto here. So we get our database IDs. Um, you could then also add not null annotations and so forth. I like to do that myself, but I'm going to skip that here. Um, so that's for time slots. Um, and now let's take a look at room. We're going to do basically the exact same thing. So let me just even just copy that because I'm a bit lazy as a program all right so and of course we need an entity here again that this is uh, also something that goes into the database same story for a lesson for a lesson this goes into the database here and there of course it becomes a little bit more complex because even though these are all normal properties the idea is a bit special but over here you can see there's some red lines already um, yeah this is not a basic attribute right so what we need to do is we need to tell Hibernate, okay, this is a many to one relationship, right? Every lesson is assigned to exactly one time slot. One time slot has um, multiple lessons assigned to it, hopefully not in the same room at the same time, of course. And um, room, same thing. One room will have multiple lessons, but hopefully not at the same time. And uh, But they could be at the same time um, temporarily, right? It could be like this in a database for a little bit of time at least. Um, so uh, we've done this, looks good. Now, um, if we start this up, what we will see, of course, is this needs to go into the H2 database, right? So if you, one of the things we've added, oh, and I forgot to add that actually, I didn't add, I didn't select when generating the code, I did not ge uh, select the H2 database. Now that's not a real big issue because I can just say, we we'll take this one and and in, I'm just going to add the Quarkus JDBC H2. And there we go. All right, we import this. You can see something going on here at the bottom. It, it kind of woke up and did that. Um, and for that to work, we need to in, have a little bit of uh, application properties. So the application properties is a file with uh, key value file where we can say where do you, you know, set all, all kinds of uh, things for the extensions. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, for the database part, so let's do this, database part, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, quarkus.data source db kind is h2 so we're going uh, because uh, we're using the h2 database in memory right now and then uh, for the username i'm going to just leave that empty the pass uh, word i'm going to also leave that empty and the um, 
uh, data source JDBC URL is actually, so we're going to use JDBC, which means that we're going, this is a memory database, which means that every time we, uh, we restart, so let's call this time table, school time tabling, school time tabling, all right. And so every time we restart, because of the in-memory aspect here, we will lose all of our data. That's not what we want to do in real time, of, in the real world, of course, but it's great for this uh, first uh, implementation and, and quickly developing through new versions without having to actually set up a database server. So I love this approach. Um, okay, so Hibernate ORM, database generation. What I want to do is every time, opt, uh, every time Quarkus here starts up, I want to drop the entire database and recreate the, the, the schema in the database based upon the lesson. So uh, you notice here, I don't create SQL statements to create the tables or anything like that. Hibernate does all of that for us based upon these entity annotations and specifically also those many to one in, uh, annotations. Also notice that the timetable is not in the database. So the timetable does not go into the database, right? It doesn't have an ID. Uh, it doesn't have that entity annotation. We're just storing the time slots, the rooms, and the lessons, those three in the database. Okay. So uh, let's take a look what we have so far. If we jump back over here, we refresh this. Uh, this doesn't crash. That's always a good thing. You see here, no problems here at the bottom. We can see that Hibernate and so forth is active. Um, but are we sure this actually works, that's, that, that we now have a database scheme and so forth? So just to make sure that all works, I'm going to create some test data here. So I'm going to add a new package. I'm calling it the bootstrap package. And in that one, I'm going to add um, a demo data generator. So that's something that will de generate a bunch of demo data for us. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to, first of all, create a method here, um, which is uh, generate uh, demo data. And so, and here we're going to create, of course, the data to, 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 to generate. But before we do that, um, we need to make sure this is picked up. So I'm going to create it, make that an application scope. That basically means that um, there's only one instance of this. And then I'm going to say, okay, in a transactional method, because of course, when we contact the database, we want this stuff to be transactional. I'm going to observe the startup event. So basically when the, um, Quarkus application starts up. We want to listen uh, to that. And when that happens, I want to cr put stuff into the database. All right. Okay, let's put some stuff into the database. Um, let's do list time slot. Um, yeah. All right, there you go. And uh, we're going to create a time slot list. We're going to give it, make it a new array list, right? And in that, we're going to add some stuff like add new. Uh, we can go back to our timetable rest method there. We can actually copy paste this, right? The new time slot that we created there. Um, and then we can do that a whole bunch of more times, right? So this is one. Um, let's do one for room also. And in the end, we need to store all of these. So what we're going to do is, let me, before we jump into the next one, let me finish this. The time slot dot persist method. Oh, there is no persist method on time slots. So how do we get this? Well, we actually used, as you can see here, RM panache, panache, right? And the nice thing about using Panache is that we can now use uh, these classes extend Panache entity base. So if we go back to the time slots and we make this extend Panache entity base, we're going to get a whole bunch of stuff for free out of the box, right? So I'm going to take this and also apply that to room and to lesson, and now all of these things have been Panache enabled. And, and why do we want that? Because now we can actually call uh, Panache persist, given, give it a list of time slots, 
and it will store this. And of course we can add more here. We can make one for 10 o'clock and one from 10.30 to 11.30 and so forth, right? And again, we can do the same approach for rooms, uh, where we do where we do where we call room dot persist uh, room list, right? And we can do the same thing for lesson, where we do lesson dot persist dot lesson list, right? And 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 that way we can create those. Now. It will take a bit long to actually start adding all of these test data, but I like to really test this with more than just one or two or three or even four lessons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy some stuff over here. I'm going to place these in there. So this is, I'm going to create 10 time slots, uh, five for Monday, five for Tuesday, first lesson starting at 8.30, last lesson starting at 2.30 and ending at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, for rooms, I'm going to do the same thing. That's a little bit simpler. I'm just going to create um, a room list with three rooms, A, B, and C. And as a three, we're going to put in the database. And for the lessons, um, I'm going to create um, I'm going to create a bunch of lessons for the ninth grade. So this is a lesson list. I'm going to create a bunch of lessons for the ninth grade. Ten of those math, physics, chemistry, biology, you can see different teachers there. And But the same, same teachers are also giving lessons to the 10th grade, so I'm going to add a 10th grade in there. And what you can see here is that now we have two math lessons for the 9th grade, three math lessons for the 10th grade, uh, but this Alan Turing now is giving up five lessons, right? It's giving five lessons across the week. And that will be interesting to see because apparently teachers cannot be in two places at the same time. So that's will be one of the hard constraints that we'll need to take into account later. Same thing for the for the for the student groups over here, like the ninth grade, they can only attend one lesson at the same time. Right? Um, so we, we actually have three hard constraints already. Room conflicts, teacher conflicts, and student groups conflict. And uh, later we'll also see some of the soft constraints to actually make their lives better. Right, of these students and these teachers. Okay, so um, that looks good. Now we need to make sure we actually fish that out of the database right over here, right? So um, let's take a look at how we can do that. Um, so we can do um, a find by ID. So what we can do is we can simply say, uh, we can make this, we can replace this. And what we can do is we can say, okay, return me a new timetable, just like before. But I'm going to take time slot, because this is a Panache entity, and I'm going to list all of those time of those time slots. I'm going to do room list all, and I'm going to do um, lesson list all. Okay. Um, and if we now do this, let's make this a little bit cleaner, All right? If we now do this um, and we restart over here, what happens? Uh, we see all of the rooms, we see all of the time slots, the ones I just spoke about, and over here we have all of our unassigned lessons, right? We have those math, so you can see here's a math lesson from Turing, math, 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 math. And then, of course, we have all of the other lessons, like physics from Curie, history from Mr. Indiana Jones, uh, biology from Darwin, of course, and so forth. Um, okay, we can, but and if we look by teacher, we can see the five teachers over here, but we don't know who will teach, we know who will teach which lesson, we just don't know when they will teach those lessons. And we, of course, by, by group, uh, student group, we can look at them too. Okay, so, um, and notice how the IDs are now visible in the thing. So each lesson actually has a database ID, which was generated as they were stored into the databases. Great, let's go back to our implementation. What's the next step? Well, um, we have, uh, well, I would like to really have these buttons working here, add the room and so forth. This still doesn't work. So what I'm going to do for that is I'm going to add a, a specific class here. Um, and let's just do room uh, today. So we do a room resource. All right. And so there's a little bit more rest methods. 
Um, again, we're going to do produce and consume uh, JSON, so I'm just going to copy that over. Uh, this will call, be called rooms. Um, I'm going to make this transactional. Why? Because all of the methods on here I want to be transactional. And so one of the things there is the, um, the add and delete room, right? So I'm going to create a response uh, where I add a room. Uh, here we go. And so we simply do room.persistRoom, and that's the panache approach, right? And I'm going to return response uh, accepted, the fact that we've accepted that room, and we built that. So we're basically going to return the same response and say, yeah, uh, it's all good. Uh, and of course, this is transactional because of that. Now, we do need this to have... Um, mention that this is a get or, or a get or a post method. As we're changing data for security reasons, this needs to be a post method, of course. And through a similar approach, we can add a delete and so forth. But I just want to show you, I'm going to skip that for here, but you can see uh, you, we can now actually add a room, submit a new room, right? And if we refresh, as long as we don't change anything in the code, that, that thing is there. However, if we change something here in the code, let's add that delete method anyway. So let's do public, re, public response delete. And we're going to just get a room ID here to delete. And that's going to be, uh, of course, a delete method. And the path will contain the room ID. Um, and we're going to here have a path param of the room ID. Okay, and then we're going to just say, okay, room based with the panache thing, find by ID. We have a find by ID here. We're going to use the room ID. And we're going to say, okay, um, if we don't find it, if room is null, what we're going to do is we're going to return the response status that the response status is not found, right? Um, so let's take a look at not found here. Here we go. And we're just going to build that. Um, otherwise, we will, of course, delete the room. That's a method we get from Panache. Um, Make sure we, we do a decent comparison there. And we're going to return the status that the response is OK. Response status will be OK. OK. Now, as I said, as I showed earlier, if we switch over here to the browser, Last time when we pr pressed refresh, the room D didn't disappear because there were no changes in the code. This time when we press refresh, the room D does disappear because there are changes in the room in the code. And of course, now we can still add room D, right? That still works. And now we can actually re re uh, remove rooms too, like room C, room this, and so forth, as I can show as I show here. Okay, perfect. Um, it's time to add some artificial intelligence to this, right? Because um, it's great. We have our timetable. We have our rooms. Uh, but we still don't have these lessons assigned, and that's where the magic comes in. So, first things first, let's enable OptoPlanner. We go back to the POM file, we throw in the OptoPlanner extension, and as we want to send that to the UI, we're going to also add the OptoPlanner Jackson thing in there. Uh, and so what do we need to do? And you can see it's already complaining about a couple of things. Uh, right now, the uh, extension still um, really likes you to uh, only be used when you have the proper annotations on those classes and you can read at the, uh, at the uh, why, what the problem is. So let's fix that. The new versions of the extension won't have this problem. So um, I'm going to make the planning, the lesson a planning entity. What does this mean? So first of all, I'm going to uh, uh, refresh IntelliJ, so it actually recognizes planning entity. And why the planning? So why the lesson? 
but that's that's actually the that's a very very important question a very a very important key concept the these lessons are the things that change during planning so the rooms the time slot don't change during planning but the lessons actually change during planning they change from where they are now an assigned to an actual assigned to a room and to a time slot so because of that reason we're going to say okay the lesson is a planning entity now the next thing is of course what of these lessons will actually what of these lessons will actually change and like i said earlier these things change right we've annotated them already so what we do is we're going to just say the um over here we're going to say well, the time slot there, that's a planning entity. That's something, a planning variable. That's something that OptoPlanner can change for us, right? Um, now, a planning entity always needs a, a value provider ref, and we're just going to call this a, a time slot range. It needs to know which time slots can I put into there, right? And it's going to do this based upon this ref to uh, a value provider, which is uh, something that will give me a list of time slots where we can choose one for each of the lessons to put into. So that's why we need the, the time slot range here. And the same problem for room. So for again, for room, we want to say it's a planning variable because OptoPlanner can change it. It needs to change it from null to a good room. And um, the, of course, we're going to, it needs to know where is my list of rooms where I can choose from. So again, we're going to make a room range here. And you'll see a minute, uh, a bit later where we actually provide those lists of time slots and those lists of rooms, right? But um, that's it for the, this side, uh, for, the, uh, for the lesson. So that's now uh, planning enabled. Um, however, to, to give something for, to OptoPlanner, we need to have this wrapper object. And this timetable is actually the, the it's, it's called a planning solution. And it's actually the ideal thing here. So um, what is a planning solution? It's basically a list of everything that goes into OptoPlanner, a list of all the time slots, all the room lists, the lesson lists. It's also going to help us provide that list of time slots, uh, which, we're, which we'll need to pick from to fill in into these time slots. Uh, feel in every time slot field of each of the lessons, right? Um, so that's this time slot table thing. Um, and in OptoPlanner terms, that's called a planning solution. So let's add a planning solution um, annotation there. And the lesson list is where it is actually all our planning entities. So I'm going to tell him that this is a planning entity collection. Right, a property that has a planning entity collection. Right, this 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 lesson list. You can do this on the getters, but I I'm using it here on the uh, fields as that's easier. So um, remember a minute ago that we for this time slot list we needed to give that. So what I'm going to say here we're going, that he can choose from that for to fill in those planning variables. Um, I'm going to create this make this a planning range a value range provider. And so the ID I'm going to use is exactly the same one as we had here on the lesson, as here is the time slot range. That's the one I'm going to use here. So now when we give OptoPlanner a timetable where it reserves a list of time slots, um, then he will pick all the, those list of time slots to put into those lesson time slot uh, fields. Um, we're, we're also going to do is we're going to do the same thing for rooms right so then basically any of these rooms that we have in here can actually be filled into the lessons room field right now the difficulty is not assigning one lesson lesson the difficulty is assigning all of those lessons in a way that they are compatible with each other right and and that's of course the hard part that's where um, it's incredibly difficult to do that. The search space is in, incredibly difficult and um, humans are actually pretty bad at it, but that's a different conversation for another time. So let's just get this uh, implemented. Now, one more thing. Um, I'm going to later I'm going to build constraints and I want to make sure that so these lessons are automatically available in those constraints but the time slots and the rooms are not by default just to make sure that they are available I'm going to annotate them by the problem fact collection property which basically means that these um, these are called facts then anything that we can use from the constraints um, 
you'll see that once we start implementing the constraint, why this matters. Um, let me maybe first indeed start with uh, the constraint uh, now, now that we're talking about those. So I'm going to create um, a package specifically for the solver part of this. And I'm going to here create a class file called the time table constraint provider. So that will define what are your hard constraints, what are your soft constraints, what do you want to optimize, what are your business goals, what are your, um, uh, how do you want to improve your um, return on investment, how do you want to improve your uh, your um, employee retention, how do you want to improve your service quality and things like that. That all goes into this class uh, as constraints. Now, um, and of course, uh, you can uh, delegate it to other classes if it becomes too many in one class. Now, um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to implement a constraint provider. Okay. Uh, here we go. And that has a single method, the define constraint methods. And for now, I'm going to leave that empty. Uh, leave constraints here. here just return an, a list of empty constraints okay um, and we have a constraint factory that is the object that will help us create constraints but for now i'm going to say there are no constraints problem solved okay now uh, let's get back to the timetable as soon as these lessons in this planning solution are being assigned to rooms and time slots then that it has a specific score. A score means what is the quality of the solution, right? The score actually tells you how many hard constraints are broken, how many soft constraints are broken. So um, we need to have that in here. And for that, we're going to add a field called hard soft score, uh, a field called score. We're going to use a simple hard soft score. OptoPlanner has many other options here. Uh, if you use more levels uh, or if you need to use if the numbers become bigger and so forth, but this is the simple, easy approach. And we're going to say, okay, this is our planning score, right? So that basically means that OptoPlanner will automatically, if it starts scheduling things, put in the score in this particular field. Okay, so far so good. One more thing we need to do, um, we need to tell, uh, let's see what happens when we run this. So when we go to the, over here, we will see that it probably complains. Let's take a look. No, it's over here. So that's good. It parsed everything. All right, let's scroll to the bottom. Everything's fine. So OptoPlanner now validated that entire domain model, checked the planning solution, checked if the planning provider uh, fits nicely to the, um, to the time slot range here and so forth and so forth. Um, okay. Now let's expose that. Let's let's see this actually uh, actually work. So let's go back to the timetable resource. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to inject a, a solver manager, right? So a solver manager um, for a timetable and anything we and the job IDs there are uh, longs. So this is a solver manager. And let's give it let's give this, and we'll let's just inject it, right? Uh, wire it in. So um, what we can now do is we can say, okay, um, I'm going to add a, a solve method, and that's when we hit the solve button. So let's do that. Public uh, void public void solve. And when this happens, we're going to call, this is a post method because it will change stuff. Uh, we're going to give this the path slash solve so we can just call it. So it nicely fits on that uh, solve button in the UI. And then we're going to say, okay, solver manager, here's something I want you to solve. Um, but I also want to listen. Um, and uh, why? Uh, because as OptoPlanner finds new best solutions, better and better solutions, I want to immediately show those in the UI. So I'm going to solve and listen. Um, so first of all, we need to give it a problem ID. As we're only solving one problem, I'm just going to hard code one here. That's the problem ID for now. And um, uh, let's maybe put that in, uh, uh, in uh, a constant. So this is, let's call it a singleton time table ID or something like this. Okay. Anyway, 
Um, what we're then going to do is we're going to do to get the solution. We're just going to do okay. Uh, get timetable sounds like a good idea. Uh, that's where we load the solution from, right? The latest version uh, before it's all before it's solved, and then when it is solved, let's call a save method. And of course, we will need to implement a save method now. So let's do that. Um, okay. So we can add a protected method here uh, to do the save of a timetable. Here we go. So can, uh, what's the problem here? Dun, dun, dun. Uh, oh, no, yeah, of course, we need to actually provide the ID. So let's also, it's actually taking that table ID and giving it to this method. So we need to create a method uh, that returns a timetable. And that does, let's do find by ID or something like this. And let's give it a long ID, right? And that ID will always be this constant now because that's the only job that we're submitting, right? And now we can actually just call that over there. So what we will do is we'll just take the code from our get method and put that there. And over here, we'll just do return find by ID of that singleton ID, right? So we're just going to rewire that get method into that find by ID. So the loading from the database is pretty much the same. Right, we still just load all our time slots, all our rooms into a lesson into there, game over. Um, just to make sure that all happens in the same transaction, we're going to make this transactional. If you don't do that, um, that can actually cause issues because then the lessons over here, um, if they're already assigned to a room of our time slots, which will happen if you want to do repeated planning, will be pointing to different instances of then these time slots and rooms that are given here if you don't have the transaction uh, annotation. So by making this into one transaction, thanks to Hibernate, these will all be, will, you know, there will only, only be one time slot instance on Monday from 9.30, right? Given that there is only one in your database and that, that, that will avoid issues. Okay, so save-wise, what we're just going to do, what we're going to do there is we're going to iterate through all of the lessons in that timetable. So we're going to ask for the lessons. Here we go, and we're going to just say, okay, um, do this is an, uh, find me the actual lesson in uh, the attached lesson. So JPA. So give find me the one that's actually in the database. Uh, that the same as in the database. That's the lesson get ID here, right? So there's the same lesson. As the one we have here, but this is actually a detached lesson, and this is an attached lesson. Um, and of course, we may need to make this transactional. So, what does that mean? Um, attached means that it's in the JPA context. That means if you make changes to it, it, it will be stored. Um, and what we're just going to change in that is the time slot and the room. So, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, attached lesson, uh, set your time slot. Set. Oh, we don't have setters there. We need to go to lesson for, an for a minute and actually add the ability to uh, set these things. So let's add a setter for the time slot and let's add a setter for the room. All right, things we were missing. Let's go back. Here we go. We're now going to say, okay, um, give me your lesson get. So we're just going to take the, the originals lessons time slot, uh, which is still attached, um, but the lessons are not because they have been changed and so forth. Uh, and we're going, just going to use that. And then we do the same thing here for room. Here we go. And now we have it saved. So let's take a look at that. So let's see if we have everything, right? When the solve method is called, we're going to submit a solve job. The solve job will find, will load the timetable from the database, and then we'll save it to the database every time it finds a new and better solution. It's going to uh, save the all of those lessons in the database, their time slot and their room changes only. Okay, fair enough. One more thing we need. When OptoPlanner is solving, we OptoPlanner needs to know how long it can solve. There's many various options on how to do that. I'm going to make keep it simple for now. I'm I'm going to use the um, just say okay, terminate uh, when 
you have a certain amount of time met. I'm going to put it on 30 seconds. So it basically means that Optoplanner will keep solving, will keep finding better solutions for 30 seconds, after which um, it will stop. Uh, you can leave it running all the time. You can leave it running until it hasn't find any more better solutions for some time. Um, there's many, many options there. You can terminate it from another thread as what you will see later. Okay, back to the code. Here we go. Let's click the solve button. Moment of truth. Yep, it's solving and it assigned everything to the first time slot in the first room. That's not really a big surprise. Why? Because we have no constraints, so it can do whatever it wants. There is nothing stopping him from assigning everything to the first time slot in the first room. Right. So let's go back. Uh, let's go to the constraint provider. Right. Because in the constraint provider, that's where we allow us to write to add hardness of constraints. So the first thing we want to add is we want to add a room conflict. Um, where we say, okay, let's do that. Uh, here we go. Create the method room conflict. So it looks good. And what we're going to do is say, okay, um, given the constraint constraint factory, right? If please select me a lesson, right? From lesson. This is pretty much like SQL. Now you're probably wondering why isn't this Java? Maybe we can actually do this in. Why isn't this just a Java of four loops and so forth, where we just get the timetable, we crow across the time slots uh, and the lessons and so forth in that timetable? Now we can do that, but it's going to be awfully slow because it won't do things like incremental calculation, indexing, um, and we want to do all of those things. And more specifically, this uh, this constraint provider will allow us to use the power of drools and cohito underneath. Um, so uh, we want to take use of those those things to actually get solutions faster and to be able to scale out. Right. So with a simple Java, which you can do in OptoPlanner, you will not be able to scale out. With this approach, you will. So OK, let's do that. So I have a, a lesson here. I'm going to join that with another lesson, All right? But I'm going to make sure that they have the same um, the same time slot, so they happen at the same time. Time slots, okay? And I'm going to make sure that they happen that they're in the same room. Let's get room. So what we now have is we basically do a. It's like a query, but it's an incremental query, um, and we're going to penalize that. And I'll, I'll show the penalize in a minute. So what we do is we're going to say, give me a lesson. If we find uh, select and me join that with another lesson, and um, if they have the same time slots and if they have the same room, then please continue. So then I basically have two lessons here. Uh, you can see this what this returns if i would say what does this return this gives me uh what we call a by stream of two lessons right so that's the two lessons that are happening in the same room in the same time and this happens for any of those any such pairs right and then we're going to say okay that's room conflict bad idea i don't want that we're going to give that a lesson uh, 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 a score let's keep it simple one heart and uh, we can even say how uh, that's enough right now. We could even uh, let it depend on the objects themselves, uh, the weight, or we can even change another weight here, like of hard or of soft, to say, okay, I want to see that this is like a very, this is eight soft weights. Uh, but of course, room conflicts is something that's absolutely not possible. So we're just going to make that a simple one hard. Let's see what happens when we run this now. So if we refresh this, we click the solve button again. Let's see what happens now. See? So this looks better, right? Because we no longer have two lessons in the same room at the same time. However, this is still an unfeasible schedule, right? Do you notice what's unfeasible is, well, here you can see it. Mm, Turing has Matt giving uh, the 9th grade, but also at the 10th grade at the same time. So if you actually look at per teacher, you can see we still have many conflicts there, right? So let's fix those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy this, say, okay, 
Um, I'm going to make this a teacher conflict. I'm going to add that here, teacher conflict. So we now add that thing over that uh, constraint. And the big difference is that we're not going to check if it's an equal room, but if it's an equal teacher. Right. Now this constraint is completely isolated from that constraint. Right. This one, the, the room conflict just checks if there are two lessons in the same room at the same time. The teacher conflict checks if there are two, if a teacher has two lessons at the same time, but doesn't doesn't mind the rooms at all. Right. Completely ignores that. And of course, uh, for there's also the student groups. So let's add the student group uh, here too. Let's add those two. Oh, because one student can only have one lesson at the same time. So the same logic there. Here we get the student group, and we can call this the student group conflict. And we go back to Quarkus. We just click the refresh button, we click the solve button, and let's see what happens. We get a different schedule. Okay. Um, why? Again, it looks good. No room conflicts, but this time there are no teacher conflicts, because now Alan Turing gives Matt can see always one room at a time you can already see what we want to change here this is not that perfect soft score wise I'll talk about that in a minute let's take a look at the student groups looks good ninth grade has one lesson at the same time so that conflict that constraint uh, is also working very well teachers right teachers hate this this Alan Turing is really hate this this schedule because why he has to show up at 8 30 do a lesson for one hour and then he has to wait for an hour uh, and do another lesson right so he this is really a terrible schedule for that that poor guy uh, same thing for uh, indiana jones here lots of gaps between those lessons that's that's no fun for the teachers so um, let's see if we can fix that so let's go back to constraints let's add an extra conf uh, a constraint and let's call it the teacher time efficiency constraint right so the teacher time efficiency constraint or um, team efficiency and of course we're going to give the constraint factory here we go now this one is quite different than the others um, because it's not just looking for conflicts what we want to do is we want to see um, if there are two lessons over here and they are sequential, I, that's a good thing. That's something I want to reward. Um, or vice versa, if I see a gap in between them, I want to penalize them. But that's a, more, a bit more difficult because like these, the lessons might not always, uh, sequential lessons might not always start at the end and start at the same time. There might be fixed breaks in there, like recess uh, and so forth, or like between Monday and Tuesday when the school closes and the school opens again, of course, right? So. Um, what we're just going to do is every time you have two sequential lessons, we're going to reward that. So um, we're going to say, okay, from again lesson. I'm going to say, okay, uh, we're going to join again any other lesson, right? And this time we're not going to look at the time slots. That's that's a big difference. What we are going to do is we're going to say joiners. Um, if it if well, if the lesson subject equals uh, if the lesson uh, sorry the lesson uh, teacher equals right if it's the same teacher that's the ones we're going to pull out right and then we're going to do a number of things with those and then in the end we're going to reward those for the the teacher uh, time efficiency and this is not a hard constraint. What that means is that um, we can break that and uh, we still have a feasible schedule, right? Uh, because if you make this a hard constraint, it's very unlikely that we'll be able to get a schedule which breaks no hard constraints. So we're going to say, okay, this is of a lower priority than these, right? Um, so we're going to, uh, and in this case, it's not just a lower priority with a lower weight, it's really a lower level. So it's not even. Uh, we could set these to the other ones to 10 heart and this just to one heart but no we're going to do it differently we're going to actually put this in the soft level and basically um, a million or a billion soft does not outweigh one heart right it's the difference is basically infinity okay now this alone is not enough because we will have plenty lesson pairs that have the same teacher now what we need to do is we need to check that um, 
if we have two sequential lessons, that's a good thing, right? So we need to, we need to, uh, I'm going to do a filter on these. Uh, this is something we cannot do with joins. So we're going to use filters, which is a little bit less efficient. So if you can do a join instead of filter, always do a join. But anyway, so we have two lessons here, lesson one and lesson two. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, um, I want you to run a, a predicate here. And the predicate is, I'm going to ask for the duration between those two lessons. So I'm going to do duration between uh, lesson one, get, get time slot. Um, and of course, we're going to do lesson one, get Time slot, get start time, um, get end time. Let's take end time because that's the first lesson. So the second lesson needs to start after this. And then the lesson two, get time slot, get start time, right? So that's the amount of time between the first lesson and the second lesson when the first lesson ends and the second lesson starts. Um, if the second lesson is before the first lesson, then between is going to be negative. So we're going to make sure that that's not the case. So we're going to rule those out. Uh, we're going to filter those out. And then we're going to check, okay, so the second lesson is after the first lesson, but is it immediately after it? And we're going to basically say, okay, um, given a duration of minutes, minutes of 30, right? If it starts within the next 30 minutes, um, then it's fine, right? So we're basically saying if the second lesson starts immediately after the first lesson or within the next 30 minutes of that, then we are happy. Then it's um, uh, then it is two sequential lessons, and that's something we want to reward. That's a good thing. So reward means give me more of that. Penalize me to do, do less of that to OptoPanner. So penalize will basically hit op OptoPanner ahead when it does that, and reward will basically re um, reward OptoPanner, give it a carrot every time it does that, right? Um, there's still one bug in here, of course, because these lessons might actually be on different dates. So what we're going to do is we're going to do here, joiners, dot equal um, now what we can do is we can make a, a, a lambda for this get lesson get time slot um, and then get day of week we're going to just make sure that they have the same day of week um, in the time slots when we join them okay and that's teacher time efficiency. Let's see if how that works out. We run this, we click the solve button, we doesn't it still runs, doesn't crash, we get a quite a different schedule. You can see it's now changing the schedule. OptoPlanner finds better and better solutions. And if we now look into the teacher thing, we of course have no conflict still, but we see that the situation for Alan Turing has improved a lot. He can actually stay home on Tuesday. Um, same for Marie Curie, she can stay home on Monday, and that's just, uh, you know, nice for them, right? So, um, that means much less commute, much less travel, and that's a good thing. Uh, and of course, we can see with the, stu with the student group, everything is still fine. Now, we would like to see how bad is it, what is the hard score, what is the soft score of these changes that we've been doing. So, to see those, uh, what we can do is we can actually go into the timetable one and we have the score here. Um, but the thing is, OptoPlanner calculates the score. And if you start looking at the results here, OptoPlanner sees he runs, uh, here's the solving ended and it will tell you what the best score is. The minus 60 heart. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's a good reason why that's minus, minus 60 heart. Let's actually go back and fix that. If you go into the Thing in the over here, we, what it will actually do is when two lessons of the same rune conflict, um, it will also match for the lesson with itself. So when you give the lesson math, and there's the other exact same lesson ID of of of, of math, will also match here, and they of course will have the same time, so it's the same room, and they will actually be penalized. So to make sure that those that that hard score over here minus 60 hard doesn't happen, that we actually get a nice 
zero score as we should be, we're going to have to filter those out. So what I usually do is I do less than um, for the lesson get ID, right? And that's a nice reason to also use a long ID. Works with your ID and so forth too, anything that's comparable. And so we're going to use that on all three tricks to filter those um, invalid matches out, right? Where a lesson matches with itself as a pair and that pair gets penalized. Now, if we run this again, all right, and we click the solve button again, here we go. What we will now see, we get the exact same solution because nothing really changed. Those were all, nothing what Optoplanner could do would, would minimize that, those 60 hard constraints, right? Um, they were always just there. But what we look now, if you look at the, when it's finished, uh, it's still running, but this is the result of the construction heuristic here. So after the constriction heuristic, it, it broke one hard constraint. And um, if we wait for the entire 30 seconds, here it is, we'll see that now we have zero hard uh, broken, which is exactly what we want. And we got an 11 soft positive score. So 11 times it was able to do sequential uh, time limits. So um, the next thing we want to do is want to make sure that the score, this score over here is shown in the UI over there, all right? So to do that, we're going to go back to the timetable resource and we're going to, uh, and we want to add here in the get timetable, we want to also add that score. So what we're going to do there is we're going to add something called a score manager, which allows us to calculate the score of a solution outside of OptoPlanner, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to add score manager for a timetable and here we go and then what we can then do, do is we can get the timetable over here and we can then say okay i have the timetable score manager please update the score into this instance you got from the database because this is coming directly from the database so top planner is not in, involved there and we did we chose not to persist the score into the database of every solution so um, we, could, we, we will just calculate it on the fly every time we give it to the ui every time the rest method is called we'll look what's what is the, the timetable in the database? And we're going to calculate the score of that and give that to the UI. And OptoPlanner will not be involved directly, uh, just the score manager will be. So when we add this, um, which we can do, um, we can we refresh over here. We will now also see the score once we solve. Here we go, score still zero. No, we don't. Hmm, interesting. Let's go back a second. What's going? Score manager, update the timetable, and we return that timetable. Mm -hmm. And we inject the score manager. Let's go back to the timetable over here. We have a planning score here, and we have... Hmm, interesting. Uh, now, in the quick start example, this does work. So I have, must have made a stupid mistake somewhere. My apologies for that. Um, take a look at uh, the uh, time, t the quick start code to see how that's done properly. Okay. Um, right now we have our solution. Um, so we still notice that the solve button doesn't work correctly. It immediately jumps back to solving while it is still solving in the background. So the way we can fix that is if we go into the timetable resource over here, we can actually add on the timetable, we can add a solver status field just to give that along. So let me just uh, add that here, a solver status field. And the solver status is either that it's it's going to be solved, it is currently solving, or it is not solving anymore, right? So um, let's add a getter for that, for the solver status. Uh, maybe the lacking of the score was the problem, the getter here. That could be, because this is indeed, uh, that could be that the lacking of the score here was the problem. Anyway, um, Let's go to the timetable resource and let's actually set that solver state. So the way we do that is we can actually get the solver state by just saying, okay, um, 
solver manager uh, get your solver state of the are you still solving yes or no and we do that before we do any of the other things to avoid uh, a race condition condition actually so we can ask the solver manager are you solving yes or no right and then we can say okay on the time table i'm going to set the solver status so we need to go back to the timetable and actually make uh, a setter for that and let me make one for the score too here we go and then we can do set solver status and we can give it the solver status here we go and we can now simply go to the ui and what you will now see is when we click the solve button you first of all the score is now showing up so the set score was actually the part that's missing um didn't go through json well um, but even as we get new solutions this button still remains red so the solver state is now known at the ui and that's why we wanted to put that into the json object too now if we wait 30 seconds you'll actually see this this uh, red button jump to green because um, as it goes looking for new solutions what it will see at some point is that the solver state has changed as it happened right now okay and this is our solution um, and you can see zero hearts broken 11 soft now there's a bunch more of soft constraints you can add um, there's a few more actually in the uh, quick starts if you look into that uh, things such as that uh, to improve the lives of students which we haven't done so far right um, but for to improve the lives of students you might not want to start monday morning with two math lessons right after each other so the same lesson right after each other is probably a little bit too much so you can add constraints to avoid such cases right uh, specifically for the students um, other interesting things for the teacher are the room stability um, so such that to make sure that they're always teaching from the same room they have basically have their own room which is good so they don't have to move between lessons um, and things like that and you can and you can probably imagine much more uh, from your time in high school yourself how you could how the schedule could have been improved much better for you like for example um, no swimming after lunch and stuff like that okay now um if you want to try any of this out um try it out like just follow this video of course but um you can also just read the the guide for this right so there's um you can find more information on optoplanet.org itself of course but if you want to specifically try it with with quarkus take a look at the link below the guide is there which has a link to the quick start example which has all of the code i've shown you here and also includes things like tests and so forth so thank you for listening and if there's any questions don't hesitate to ask them uh, below this video